techno music was created in Detroit back in the mid to late 80s, and it's credited to Juan Atkins, Derek May, and Kevin Saunderson. If you ask somebody from Detroit that was around in the beginnings of the music, what is techno music, they would say, oh, that's, that's Derek, that's Juan, that's the guys. Rock, we got alternative rock, so why we can't have alternative, urban alternative or alternative soul? They took aspects of gospel, they took aspects of, of blues, they took all that, and they just took it and just molded it and deconstructed it and made it into this, this form that's, that's unbelievable. Every piece of music has an open door that intersects with another sound. Fuck the, all the fluffy IDM, all that crazy shit. This is the real fact of how this shit started. It was just breaking overseas. There wasn't money, there wasn't fame. It was just music. And it was just futuristic music and sounds that you'd never heard before. You say Detroit techno and it means something to people. It, it triggers an emotional response more than just a genre. Techno music is underground dance music. You know, um, high tech soul. Detroit uh, can be a heaven for some, it can be a hell for others. This is the back of the house where the stuff got made. I think it has to be said that Detroit is an unrelenting success story. Detroit is a weird city in that it doesn't have, uh, it might be a big city, but it doesn't have the big city mentality. In a city like Detroit where it's as desolate as it, as it could be, it's not, a, it's not a horrible city but it's just a, it's, it's a horribly designed city. This, in a way, there's not much down here, but there's a heart, and there's something that makes it much more than what you see. We don't have a thriving, bustling downtown area where our, all the tourists go and to go do the shopping and hang out at the club. We don't have that. Detroit is lovely. Detroit is beautiful. Now you gotta realize, at the time in Detroit, um, you're talking about uh, serious economic downturn, recession from the early 80s. They were still getting over oil embargoes and, and, and whatnot from the 70s. Um, uh, there was the, the white flight. There was the vestiture from the city. Uh, downtown was laying in shambles. The white flight of Detroit is a myth in the sense that there was no such thing as flight. Flight denominates a sudden pattern of behavior like a flight of birds taking up off of a pond. By 1953, the city of Detroit had already established the patterns of exurban depopulation that people associate with post-1967. The U.S. government were involved in making it advantageous for people under the aegis of the GI Bill, for example, not to come back and live in cities after the Second World War, but to move to suburbia. The city was completely built. That is the point then, if you wanted a new house, you had to move to suburbia. We were your classic Rust Belt city. Everybody moved to the burbs. Uh, a lot of vacant buildings, a lot of burnt out hulls. So, say, in 1967, something terrible happened. Those people, whoever those people are, did something awful to my city, and now I had to leave, is simply nonsense. That's a bunch of nostalgic rot. The city was, was fast becoming majority black. Um, we didn't have a lot of resources. What happened in 1967, specifically in Detroit, is that a long pattern of exclusionary practices and a long pattern of segregation, both legal and quasi-legal in the city, simply erupted into violence. How do you feel about it? Uh, I think that uh, if they pull the troops out, then uh, detention would be all over and uh, everybody would go back to home. And those who engage in looting or arson or sniping or other illegal actions will have to uh, pay the consequences. All I can say is, I hope it ends quickly. Then it became convenient to say, that's why we did what we did, instead of investigating the actual reasons why we did what we did. That is, we decided to depopulate cities at the end of World War II. We didn't decide to depopulate cities the day after the so-called riot in 1967. Uh, when somebody asks me, will the city ever come back, I tell them, it's back. It never went anyplace. You left, maybe, but the city never did. All the ones that left, no, we here. The city's still here. Uh, now, of course, the city has economic problems, social problems, etc. Right, okay. 
The city is doing as well as could be expected and probably better for what has happened. Capital left, the tax base, or a big piece of it left. Imagine a city that was designed for four million people that less than a million people only occupy now. We were brought up on our parents going to work every day and working in the, auto, in the car automotive industry and coming back home and telling us that we, they work with robots. There was a lot of fallout based on uh, things switching over to automation and computers and, and robotics taking over uh, where, where people once worked and, and, and thrived. But it wasn't really a, a bad thing. It was just the city was in transition to a technological base. People don't have money to buy food or clothing or other things, necessities and luxuries that we like to enjoy, then these attitudes usually come out in our music. What has happened is that something extraordinary and wonderful and unique has happened instead of what every other city has. We got space. And it's not just space that's empty, it's space that's full of the artifacts of American industrial culture. It's a place like no other. It provides food for people's imaginations in a way that no other site does. And that has a great deal to do with the insertion of urban techno into this cultural and social domain. We have three incredible natural resources. Fresh water, salt, techno. Ever, I, I do not remember Detroit changing since I was a little boy. That's when there was people walking on the street. That's when there was businesses on the street. That's when there was um, uh, some sort of uh, social level here. You could actually meet people. There are some really fascinating people in the city, but you'll never meet them because nobody walks. Nobody walks. Nobody, nobody talks, and so nobody walks. So nobody talks, nobody walks, nobody walks, nobody talks. It can get pretty boring at times. And so, you know, in order to pass the time or to, to get out of that, you have to find other things to do. <laughs> I'm 38 years old. I haven't seen any change. You know, in, in 28 years, nothing. Nothing, nothing. Nothing! The only change that I've really seen here is us. You know, we have... We have changed, but the city has not. Detroit's a, a, a tough city. It's, it's had a rough time uh, historically, and, and it's almost like the, the eye of a storm that just has had never you know, re recovered. But that's what makes Detroit Detroit and the whole underground thing and the whole sound, because it's a deprived sound trying to get out, you know? Because we had all of our major impressions gave us the impression that this is the way, way the rest of the world was. And then coming from a city like Detroit, if you don't leave here, you don't know. There's something here, and something happens uh, on a creative level here that doesn't seem to happen anywhere else. Detroit, you won't find it anywhere but here. And the people are what keeps it so animated. You know, being a kid in Windsor back in like 86, 87, if you wanted to you know, find anything different, you ended up coming to Detroit. When I go out of town and then tell people I'm from Detroit, the reaction I get is like, either they're really scared of me instantly, or they say, why do you live there? There's an attitude that you get coming from this city that you don't get nowhere else. Who would ever have thought of making music with an old turntable and a scratchy record and sticking it in an abandoned warehouse or an abandoned factory site? I'll tell you who thought of it, people in Detroit. That's who did. Techno, the first time I heard the word was probably through Wanak. It came about from Alvin Toffler's uh, Future Shock. The Techno Rebels is, is where that term comes from. And it's because they took technology and they made it a black secret. Wan was the one that came out and emphatically said techno. And at first, the compilation was going to be called The House Sound of Detroit but the track that I submitted was called Techno Music. And listened to the lyrics and they said, oh, well, we gotta change the name of this record. And it, it was called The Techno Sound of Detroit. And it literally, you know, I don't know, it was like 
a hundred point type on the album cover, you know, techno with an exclamation point. I mean, it was, there was no turning back from there. And the record was huge in Europe. And uh, one, of the, one of the singles to come off, off of that album was Big Fun. And that record like went number one in the UK. Basically, techno is usually four on the floor, boom, 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 with the tick, boom, tick, boom, tick, boom, tss, tss. that's more house, tss, tss, boom, with the four on the floor. Okay, this is the uh, 303, like this is a 606, and a 202. These are just like, they look like toys, but they really can do a lot of damage if you're making it good. And then you have uh, break beats, which are different breaks from old records or whatever you can find, and they just they speed them up and they put a loop to them. It's like boom, 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 spat, boom, spat, spat, boom, spat, boom, spat, that, that, boom. Jungle is more boom, 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 boom. That's more like the jungle sound. <laughs> I probably don't know what the hell I'm talking about, and you probably don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but somehow we'll get there, right? <laughs> Things have been influencing, I think, this sound since guys like Raymond Scott and the Manhattan, Manhattan Research Project. Craft work has to be given an acknowledgement because everybody thought they were a joke. Basically, techno, the deep, deep roots are like craft work, soul sonic force. Um, from disco, Giorgio Moroder. I mean, that's the first time we heard tech stuff. And I was listening to this music with him, records from Kraftwerk and Sly Stone and Cameo and, and just music in general, you know? Uh, you have to name, I think you have to name them all. You cannot expose one person. There was a lot of electronic music um, there was Depeche, I mean, I'm not going to go down the line, because I can't, I mean, I can't, I'm not, my, there's Depeche Mode, Thompson Twins, New Order, there were all these type of groups that were making very, very electronic only type of music. We just coined the phrase techno, but we were definitely influenced by a lot of the Euro sound. A lot of my early music, I mean, I, of course, George Clinton, P-Funk, that whole thing, I grew up with that, and that was like, the the group for me. Post high school years, early college years, everybody uh, got turned on by Chicago. Chicago was uh, the exact forerunner of uh, what the music is today, as far as the the concept of of, of really um, taking some raw spaces, taking some raw systems, taking some raw jocks and some raw music and beating the heck out of it until it just uh, it just took us over. The innovators of, of techno, per se, uh, of course, the guys from Detroit, it's Juan, Kevin, and Derek. Kevin, Juan, and Derek. Derek and Juan and Kevin are truly the, the masterminds behind that. If it wasn't for them, there would be no techno. The guys who started it all for me. They're remarkable, remarkable talent. You know, they were just doing it because they loved doing what they did. But I never thought at any moment that it was going to be the phenomenon of, of, of what it's become. I want to say a special thanks. Juan isn't here tonight, but without Juan, he's the originator. Derek is the innovator. They call me the elevator. And we, <laughs> we worked as, as a team, and uh, we're just truly blessed. They were doing just phenomenal stuff with, with, with these makeshift living room studios, and they were producing some of the, the hardest core house music that you would have ever have heard. It's not easy to do that. I mean, a lot of the stuff, that early stuff that Derek and some of those guys did were triggered. Man, it took hours to do that kind of stuff. You know, it wasn't alternative, it wasn't electro, it was something in between. And the more I heard it, the more that, you know, that kind of grabbed me and kind of pulled me in deeper and deeper and deeper until I was in the middle of it all. And I call them the masters because they, they mastered the art of, of putting all that music together and making you dance for six or seven hours straight and, and, and taking you wherever they wanted you to go. Before any of that even became music, 
uh, you know, for the masses to hear. Um, I thought that it was, uh, I thought those guys were onto something then, but they just took it just to a whole nother level. Whole, whole nother level. The person who probably was the most influential for me was Juan. Juan Atkins ha has uh, changed a lot of people's lives, and, and I'm sure he knows it, but it, he's the one. You know, Juan is on a whole different level. <laughs> Juan Atkins is the person who put all of these crazy ideas of doing electronic music in Detroit <laughs> into any of our heads. Juan is a creative genius. And actually his track, The Chase, was the track that influenced me to make music. Juan was definitely the the most influential, who, who got the curiosity going about this electronic style of music. Some of the highest highs I've ever experienced in my life were with Juan Atkins at the wheels. Juan was always the quiet, really quiet type. I didn't even realize he made music until, you know, after knowing him maybe a year and a half. I happened to go by the studio, Juan had a studio, and uh, Derek took me by there uh, unexpectedly. That's when I knew he was doing something pretty creative. My last two years in high school, I learned how to read and write music. I took music theory courses, theory one, theory two. Right after I graduated, I made my first record. He was making records when nobody, nobody knew about this music. So it, he spent, some of his best years have been spent just trying to help develop the music. You know, uh, just trying to put the music on a level where it existed. After I graduated, I met this guy, Rick Davis. And we both formed, formed this group called Cybertron and released uh, a record called Alleys of Your Mind. One night, Warren Atkins came down. They had this tape, dun, 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 dun. and I was listening to it. I said, wow, man, I like this. I told them to hold on one second. And they were sitting out in the lobby, and we had a radio in the lobby. All of a sudden, they heard their song come on the radio, and it blew their minds. It blew my mind, too. It had the P-Funk just round, resonant rubber band bass line to it, wah, 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 right? And, uh, and then this uplifting utopian chords and stuff. Um, and it just, people would bug. You play that track in any club in Detroit and you got an instant party. And started Metroplex and another group myself, which I call Model 500, and I started this label and released my first Model 500 record around 85 called No UFOs and the future. See, Juan take it intake and Cybertron is a more spiritual. See, this is what a lot of kids miss is a spiritual intake. It's spiritual. And he broke some shit down to me that I can't even I can't even regurgitate that shit back to you. Hearing a Juan Atkins do clear. That track is anthemic to people in London. Um, it's anthemic to Mike Banks of Underground Resistance here. It's anthemic to me. Even though he was only a few months older than me, it was like a mentorship. He, he was there for me when I was developing and working on my first music. He gave me uh, the insight and the, 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 the development, you know, and the, the confidence as well to make music. <laughs> Thank you. 
the rest of the world just caught up. They're just starting to acknowledge what this individual did. Kevin's the guy who, who basically made sure that the music got to the masses. Uh, is one of the coolest guys I know, the most down-to-earth person I know, um, especially considering what he's done for the music and, and uh, the things that he's into. And, and I have so much, a lot of respect for what he did with Inner City. And, and uh, I mean, he was one of the first guys who had like a crossover hit. Uh, he sold, I don't know how many records, six million records worldwide or something like that. Um, he, he is uh, obviously the most successful commercially successful out of, out of all of them. Kevin, on the other end, was the first person who gave me a name to put on the record. Kevin, Kevin spanks. When he starts bumping, it's, it's a spanking. And you just start screaming more, you know? My influences were uh, pretty broad, I, I think, um, but dance-wise, disco-related stuff, stuff with a consistent pulse always seemed to to grab my attention more. I remember we, we did a club on a Monday night called Spectrum with Paul for many years ago, and one of the biggest records was, uh, was, was Good Life. I have to say my career really started about 1983. The reason I think I started is because of Derek, Derek May. Let me clear this up real quick. Kevin told you that he, he took me down back in the day, right? You know, okay. We, we had a little fight uh, before we became friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we met. He, Derek used to get on my nerves, basically. He was, you know. Just, he was always off with the mouth. Fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah, he beat me up. And uh, I beat him up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let me see. I, I can't really top that because, because that did happen. But the circumstances weren't as he told them, whatever he might have, may have told you. He actually tapped me on the shoulder, and when I turned around, he punched me. So it wasn't as if we were out in the yard, two guys going at it, he took me down. This guy, this bigger than me guy, okay, knew everybody in the school knew he was gonna do it. So he walked up to me, he tapped me on the shoulder, because I think we had bet on the Super Bowl. And I decided I wasn't gonna pay him, you know? So uh, he tapped me on the shoulder, I turned around and he socked me in the nose and hit me in the mouth. He knocked me out, you know? That's right, but somehow from that, I don't know how it's possible, but we became best friends. Became the best of friends, which is amazing. I think, you know, he said, I'm just not gonna say nothing about this guy anymore. You know, I was big too. Fucking Kevin. Should kill him tonight. But see now I'm, you know, you know, I'm a little bit quicker and faster than him now. You know, so I can get inside and boom, boom, boom. Isn't that strange? Isn't that weird? This guy gave me a concussion, you know, at the at the at the tender age of 14. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Juan was making records, and Derek made his first record. Then I wanted to make music too. Kevin was able to t put a lot of hybrids into a style. You know, he wasn't he wasn't seen as just being you know this kind of techno guy. He did house, he did um, you know vocal things, he did all kinds of stuff, and he went a lot uh, further uh, creatively, I believe, than than what. Derek and Juan have been able to do. So I, I went from being underground to having commercial success, but I think because of the timing, because of the vision, because of the sound, it was a lot of things that played 
uh, important roles in that success. Um, Super nice guy. Anyone could walk up and talk to Kevin and have a conversation with him. You know, without him, I think that the techno wouldn't be anywhere that, that it is now. character. Perfect, Tim. Derek May came in as the prima donna from fucking hell. Very opinionated. Super macho, super hyper, master, techno, knucklehead. He, uh, he has his persona for the media, and then he has, and then there's Derek, and they're pretty different people. Me and my boys was like, that dude's an asshole, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you're right. And a couple of people just wanted to sock him because, you know, he, he was shooting his mouth off because he would say, you know, why the fuck you ain't doing it this way? You know, why the fuck you want to do that? Why, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know. Do it this way. What, are you stupid? You know, to anybody, it didn't matter who the fuck it was, you know. He's the, the most unique out of all, of anybody I know, probably. Derek, he's, uh, he's got personality traits that everybody wants, and he's got some that nobody wants. He's a classic uh, artist. Uh, I've been knowing Derek since middle school. Uh, when I moved to Bell, I moved to Belleville like in ninth grade and uh, from Detroit. Kevin, I'm out here in Chicago. They got great music, it's a great scene. And I'm moving back to Detroit, you know. Um, let's hook up. I seen that he was really into the music. He was into it before I left, but he had, his level had changed of uh, the music. He seen something that I was unaware of. Although I started making music uh, five years or seven years before Derek started making music, he was always around. He always watched the process, and I can remember him always saying to me, one day I'm going to make a record. You know, he just, he always said that to me. And then eventually he made his record, and he done real well. And he had a roommate, Art Payne, and they were making music, and they asked me to come over and listen to it. It was very different. It was techno. There was no such thing at the time. But here I was listening to this music, and I thought it was kind of good. I had the very drum machine where Streams of Life was produced on right downstairs. <laughs> he was trying to find whatever warehouse space he could get his hands on, and whatever sound system he could get his hands on, however he could get his hands on it, to hold these late night dance-a-thons, basically. And then look what he did. He blew up worldwide. Uh, I always thought he was great. <laughs> First record I ever brought, bought was uh, the Who, Tom, the Tommy album. Don't ask me why. I mean, I have no idea why a black kid from the city, his first album would be uh, a Tommy record, but I wanted that record. Uh, one of the first second nights I met Rich, we went to an after party that Derek was playing at, and I was introduced. It was cool, you know, hey Derek, how's it going? I like your music. And uh, the second time I met him, he remembered my name. And I was very flattered that such a famous guy like Derek would remember little old me. Um, Derek opened up his doors and his heart to, to myself and a lot of people. Derek is a very open guy. Derek, on the other end, he brought out the artistic development and the, artist, uh, the musicianship into what I was doing. Derek has always been very motivated to, to make his music part of the mainstream. 
to be part of something that you could turn on when you wanted to, to be part of something that you could go buy, you know, in a store. And, and not just for his own economic um, uh, elevation, but for just the elevation of the music. The man is, is, is rabid about that music. Well, normally, normally the process for me in writing a song completely overall is um, I get butt ass naked. Uh, I put some hot oil all on, you know, and I shake it up real good. And I sit on down with some baked beans and some lemon heads. And I get down, Boston baked beans. And I get down, I be farting, and I be making tracks. <laughs> I'll never tell you my theory to making music. That's a secret, man. Next question. what he was doing artistically, not just wanting to make music for the sake of making money. He has this energy that is so buoyant, um, and it comes through in his music. I quit talking about Derek May, because he, he said some nice things about me, so I won't go off on him no more. Oh, the old Eddie Folks thing rises his head again. Um, I went to high school with Derek and Kevin. Eddie didn't go to high school with me. Because of that, Eddie is not included in certain discussions. Uh, Eddie, I have the deepest, deepest respect for Eddie Folks. He was right there at the forefront with us all. I, didn't, I don't think I met Eddie until maybe after my second or third record. Eddie, of course. Man, of course you don't forget me, man. And uh, <laughs> how good do you want to look? How good do you want to look? Hey, I was good when it came on my mama womb, boy. <laughs> he, he's a, quite a character, you know. Actually, Eddie lived with Kevin and Derek on different occasions before, so they know Eddie. And then Juan's brother-in-law got out of Jackson Prison. He had a place to stay. So I looked out for a kid. So he said, folks, for looking out for me, I'm going to put you on this tip. It's a credit card scam tip. Okay, this is the true story, all right? So he put us on the credit card scam tip. My roommate was Derek. So therefore, <clears throat> we start ordering equipment, everything, all types of shit. So we start breaking the houses and setting up shit so, you know, so you can get the equipment. So UPS man come, get your shit, run out the back door, get in the car, you're gone, right? So I had turntables, uh, everything you want. I was the man. but. You know, Derek didn't, couldn't figure out what the fuck we were doing. That's what happens. I think that maybe during that time period, him and Derek must have fell out because he has a tendency to fall out with you. And when things started happening, you know, if they had an opportunity to, like, not include Eddie or say, see, you should have still, you should have been cool, they used that to, 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 to work against him. Derek more or less had uh, the, 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 the inside track and he left Eddie out. But I never, it never bothered me. You know, it, it, it bothered me, but you know, it just came, all this came as a spirit, spiritual thing, and being nice to people. So, you know, I just knew a matter of time it's gonna come up. It's, it's, I'm gonna get my props. It, that one, it, didn't, it, didn't bother, it didn't take me to that deep end, like, you know, oh, I wish I, that negative shit. I was so high, and I had smoking some bud, and I, had, I was mixed, I wanted to make this mixtape, and I just, just left the fader in there. And you know how when you're high, you'll just your shit be going shh. And I knew what these two songs were, but when they came together, I said, damn, that's the third song. He says, hey, he said, I want you to write something in that record for me, you know? I said, okay, Eddie, what, <laughs> what do you want me to put? He says, yeah, he says, I got all these loops in there, you know, I got a loop here and a loop from there and a loop. 
I want you to put Luke Jack Mother Ever, you know. I said, okay, all right, Eddie, I'll put that in. And, you know, I thought about it after he left. I said, you know what, I could be a Luke Jack Mother Ever too, you know. You, 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 everybody knew that if it weren't for folks, it wouldn't be a domino effect. No Carl Craig, no Kenny Larkin, especially no fucking ass Richie Harden. Not to take anything away from Derek, Juan, or Kevin, because um, I'm, the three of them deserve the credit that they got. But yeah, Eddie was involved in those early, early years. It wouldn't be none of this shit, you know, but it was a spiritual-led base. Don't laugh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the block. I built the block with Juan and others. You know what I'm saying? So that is the thing that I'm talking, trying, trying to explain to you. The Music Institute was started by four young guys um, with, uh, with just a heavy-duty background in partying and house music. Myself, Alton Miller, Anthony Pearson, and my brother-in-law, Frank Moore. They would rent out uh, space in uh, in these buildings. And it was the inner city, downtown. It was a lot of black people going to this music institute, which was where uh, Derek, Kevin, and, and uh, those guys used to spend. Most clubs at that time in Detroit was either punk, top 40, or alternative type things, you know? And then here comes the institute, which was new, it was different. But it was electronic music. And that's where the music got its real, um, that's where it vaulted from one level to the next. It was new to everybody. This club was like a, uh, was like a, it was like a shrine overnight. People came from nowhere with no promotion. They just came. You know, my brother and I waited there, we got our memberships, and we went in and we danced because we knew we loved this music. And we knew that it was the only place around the area, and at that time, it, 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 one of the only places on the planet that you could hear this type of music that pure. We didn't know who we would cater to. We didn't know what the heck would happen. I mean, this place was open from midnight until six in the morning. They let, they, they let the kids out of the place at six o'clock in the morning, sweaty and beat up. <laughs> and there was no drugs in there. The kids smoked their weed, they had their drink before they came in, and it was all love in the building. I had no idea it was it was as influential as it was at the time. Derek has had to sit me down and say, George, man, this is what happened. It was really beautiful. And it was truly the first real underground techno club in the world. Wow, is that right? That's incredible. <laughs> it was just a dark hole with a strobe light, and it was rocking. I think one of the things that probably um, also had a big impact on how we got here is electrifying Mojo. There was a guy named Mojo. I only get a minute. So with this minute, I hope I can try to get as much as I can in. Mojo was more than an inspiration. He was a door. And he opened and out came all these weird, creative things that just like fell on us and somehow, oof, I still got, I still got like, creative pops. They're coming for me right now. That's my limo. And uh, Mojo's, in, Mojo's in the limo, as a matter of fact. My name is Electrifying Mojo. I spend my life as uh, pretty much an observer of life. I had a rare opportunity to uh, take all of those observations and convert them into music every night on the radio basically play what he wanted to play. And he was playing Prince and Peter Frampton and all that kind of stuff. 85, 86, I was listening to Juan, or Juan's music was being played on Mojo's station, or uh, program, heavily. It was always about the music. Is it hot or is it not? And if it was not, no amount of money or influence uh, could interest me, period. And uh, you couldn't really have a, a you couldn't really break a Detroit a record in Detroit without him playing the record. So he was that powerful. Yeah, Mojo was the one that discovered Jeff Mills. Of course, he was the wizard then. He became Jeff Mills later. He knew he was playing to black people, but he insisted upon playing this music anyway because this is not what black radio was playing during the day. And he went completely against the grain, and he had number one ratings across the board. People like Juan Atkins, Derek May. 
any folks, Kevin Sanderson, um, all those people, you know, they proved everybody wrong because they were able to be vocal enough to say, hey, Mojo, we are listening. And that gave me a lot of inspiration and a lot of encouragement. So, you know, as much as they say I inspired them, it was uh, definitely a reciprocal process. Neil Rushton, that he would eventually be our manager, myself, Kevin, and Juan. And he said, I would love to have you come over here and talk to you more about your music and see if we could develop a relationship and try to help you get a record deal. I was floored. As far as I'm concerned, he was one of the first outsiders that actually came into the circle and, and, and was interested in the music and, and actually uh, had a business direction for it. You know, because actually, New Photo was the record that Neil Rustin came over here and picked up. That was the first record he actually heard, which was Derek's record. I talked to my mother. I said, should I get on the plane? Should I buy my own ticket? She said, it's up to you. You do what you think is best, but I think you should do it. I said to Kevin, what do you think I should do? Kevin said, do it. Pay the money, go. Juan said, no, don't go. Don't do it. If they can't pay your way, you don't go. Now, I actually would normally weigh Juan's decision more than I would weigh even my own mother's decision at that, at that point in my life. I decided to go. I got on the plane. I went to England, I paid my own money for the first trip to meet this man who would eventually help us do many things, remixes, productions. He would help Kevin Saunderson eventually get his inner city deal where, it, where Kevin made big fun and good life and was going to sell six or seven million albums. He would help Juan get the remixes and the production he wanted and the, the, the sort of press and respect that we needed. We would get the major article in Face Magazine, which really just launched us. So it was a good thing to get on that plane, and that was a good day. You know, when, you, when you're getting into the music business, you're going to get screwed over early on until you know. Until you know, you don't know. It's like Neil kind of um, made us turn against each other. It's like, you know, when he brought them, when the money came into the picture, it started off, we were all cool. We were all friends and stuff. Like, I was, I trusted Kevin to make right decisions. I kind of trusted Derek, but, you know, once he brought us over to the UK, everyone got greedy, and he kind of fed off that, I think. And it was, that was, that tension that, that existed between all of the egos was, was, was part of it. Uh, not, not necessarily a fun part of it, but it was a part of it. And uh, those guys went at it on a constant basis. Back biting, back stabbing, shit talking. Who could spin, who couldn't spin, who cleared the floor, who didn't clear the floor, who, you know, who knew the true, you know, masters, uh, what, what their interpretation of the music was, what was his interpretation of the music. Did he have a clue, did he have a clue? I think, you know, a lot of entities was like splitting us up and, and we didn't know how big this music was blowing up over in Europe. Derek knew, you know, Derek was the first one to go over there, so he knew. So, you know, it was more like, you know, you know, trying to put the, the how can I say it, uh, trying to control some shit he didn't know how to control. Well, about the second wave of techno, uh, definitely have to go with uh, Rob Hood, Claude Young, um, Shake. Shake Secure, Underground Resistance. And that's a big career, that's a big list.
Mike Banks, Jeff Mills, Rob Hood. They kind of woke people up to a darker, harder, harder edge. When I went to Berlin the first time in 1991, I walked into Trezor, I walked downstairs, and I walked into the most intense dance floor I had seen outside of Detroit. And they were playing one of my records, and I walked through the crowd, through the smoke, and who was playing it? Jeff Mills. It was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. Mike Banks and I, we had made the very first release from Underground Resistance, which was a, a vocal track called um, uh, Your Time Is Up. I took it home to my mother because I wanted her to see why we were staying up so late at night. So I let her hear it and, and she listened to it and she said, it's, it's nice but it needs more bass. <laughs> so I, I thought, you know, I think I think she's right. You know, so we went back and we re remixed it again, <laughs> and um, she she was right, and it, it sounded much much better. Mike and the UR Posse, probably like, you know, without those guys for sure we wouldn't be here because in the early days, Plus Eight and, and UR were really kind of the driving force for a little while, and it was we had a little bit of you know Mike even says it now it was like a little bit of sonic warfare going back and forth. They were shooting records out that were blowing our heads and every time we thought we had come up with something really amazing they'd shoot something back to us we'd go back to the studio i'd be like dan man we gotta make something better mike banks who is somebody i admire a great deal and one of my musical heroes i remember uh doing gigs mike and myself mike banks and myself for little to no money at all but it was the love of the music that uh, that kept us Strife, you know, just kept us going forward. He's got a personality on him. Mike is a man's man. He don't take no shit from nobody, you know. And one of the most amazing things that Mike Banks has done was to invent and develop underground resistance. And the whole sort of mentality behind underground resistance is a real relation to the city itself. Because there's this mystery and this mystique about Detroit from the outside looking in, you know? It's as if it's a city with tumbleweeds and just like people just sort of, you know, war, like the gunslinger comes to town mentality. I can remember going to Italy once about 10 years ago. People were going crazy over underground resistance and they weren't even there. It was as, as if somebody came along to Italy and just took a helicopter and just dropped a ton of t-shirts in Rome. You know, because every other kid I saw on the street had an underground resistance t-shirt. It was like a, 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 like a, almost like a cult. I guess you could say underground resistance is the sort of, uh, the Arkham Asylum of the, of the techno thing here in Detroit. You know, that's where all the guys go when they sort of uh, want to touch the other side. The rave scene um, kind of came in contact with Detroit City around 93, and it really kind of, you know, literally and figuratively brought new life into the city. It seems like the, the size of the party is, is really important, and that has its own problems, of course. It starts to become less about the music and more about a production. You know, that, that, wasn't, that didn't mesh too well with Detroit techno culture. And they're breaking up one right now. And uh, I think one of the people that helped define what Detroit raves and what the Midwestern uh, feeling was all about was, was Richie Houghton. started doing parties was at a, a, at a key pivotal point in kind of the history of American parties and raves anyway. I was coming back from Europe at that time, going to places like England at the Lost Parties, going to Trezor in Berlin, and I was, you know, seeing that and, and having, reminiscing about the Institute, these dark black boxes with speakers and, and just like music, and that's what it was always about. And so the reason we started doing parties in Detroit was to get back to, you know, the original concept. And in a way, you know, our parties were a little bit anti-rave. They were, you know, it was just fucking huge Cerro in Vegas, a strobe light. And because it became so pure again, they became really successful.
suddenly we went from 500 to 1,000, 2,000 people at the Packard building. You forgot who you were, where you were, and, and why you were there. And it became about this beat, this environment. And eight hours later, we spit you out and you went home. So we love Detroit Techno. Yeah. <laughs> we love Detroit Techno. Purists in Europe that you can still go play in front of five, 10,000 people that they want to hear good music. They treat DJs like superstars over there. It, it's really different, it really is. And then you come home and you know they think your name is Larry and you're a drug dealer. A lot of them can walk down the street here in Detroit and they don't necessarily, people don't necessarily know who they are. I, I think it's huge because once again, we've touched the world. I mean, uh, you know, some of the artists that you see on this wall being exhibited, I mean, they, they just, they're just back from Tokyo or London, or Paris, uh, doing shows, performing, they're in demand. People know that they're from Detroit. People know that this is really the mecca of this music. And that's, that's huge, it's a huge statement for our city. You know, following the Motown sound, I was taking the big difference between the scenes between the U.S. and, and Europe, Europe is that Europe has, uh, has a real support level uh, for the club we don't have. We don't have beer companies, uh, Amstel, uh, Beck's, uh, whoever it might be supporting or backing a uh, nightclub. I think techno is a different story over there. I think the music has, has a life of its own uh, and has a bigger presence in Europe. Music, because it's, it's, it's music, uh, is one of the only things that I, I feel that humans have that transcends everything. Uh, language, uh, culture, anything. So you can, especially when it's instrumental. My life, Derek's life, Kevin's life, Kenny, Richie, all these guys, our lives are flying on airplanes. Yeah, I just played in Bosnia, so South Africa, all over Europe, Belgium, France, Netherlands, um, Austria, Swiss, Germany, and the United States. Uh, Turkey, Russia, uh, I've played in Jerusalem, uh, South America. In Berlin, it's still, you can still get away with some shit, and that, that's special. I've done thousands of gigs. I've played in airplanes. I've played in bomb shelters. I've played um, underwater almost technically. I've played in the middle of a pool surrounded by water, people splashing water on my records. And I didn't like that because I'm, I'm really anal about keeping my records clean. I am, myself and Derek May, driving three hours through the Andes Mountains we saw the stars, we saw the moon, we saw everything. I don't think you can get better than that. The most special moments of my life was uh, uh, when I played in Macedonia. Um, we went for dinner, went to a restaurant, we sat down. The guy put four plates down for everybody. Nice guys. And um, I ordered, and they spoke in, in the language, and um, the food came. It's one, it's just a dish for me. I'm like, where's the rest of the food? You know, and the guys say, they all look at me. I said, oh, we don't have enough money to eat here. We could never eat here. We brought you to eat. And that was heavy. The future of techno is, is, is new faces and new voices. Everyone has a um, studio and everyone has a label. It's much harder to establish yourself as a DJ, producer, or whatever. It's so hard. Ghostly came about as a mental idea, our approach was more like, let's do music, let's make it exciting, let's have fun. But uh, the label really happened in college when I met Matthew Deere at a party and saw him play techno, talking to him about music, becoming friends, DJing with him, hearing his live music. I, I'd like to consider myself a dance artist. I mean, that's what I got into this for, was to watch people move to a, a certain sound. And... The 
There's gonna be a lot more music, a lot more techno music, but the innovators will rise. The, you know, those with um, credibility will rise. People are gonna rediscover techno in a big way coming up in the near future. Actually, I hope it will become a little more commercial so people can have res a little more respect for it and not look at it as just this underground thing where you can go into a dark place and uh, pop a pill or whatever and uh, go to the cyber la-la land. It's so many facets of the music, it, you can't stop it. It's gonna show its head, you know, in a big way. I believe that a lot of people live off the blueprint of what we did, and that's, a, that's really flattering, that's cool, that's, that, that, that makes us feel wonderful, but that doesn't take the music to new levels. So I, I believe that the next wave of electronic music is coming from some black kid that we, we have no idea and he's gonna get a laptop and he's gonna stumble on all these, all the software and all these programs and he or she is gonna be the next thing. It's still a very young genre and it's still defining itself and going out to all the possible extremes. Once you make, a, once you make music, once you do an art form, it's no longer, it's yours. You created it on that level, but it's no longer yours. You know, it's, a, it's public domain. It belongs to whoever can get their hands on it. So all the passion and desire and love that we had for what we had done, and we got the great crowd, and oh, we got this real thing for the city, because you know, we hate the city, but we love the city, and this is passion, and we're on a mission, and we're gonna do this. We forgot that there's a such thing as the post, mail, trucks, airplanes. Shit flies, travels. Somehow, you never know whose hand it's gonna end up in. You don't know where it's gonna end up in the, it, period. Never dawned upon us that this would go across the world. Just never even thought about it. I'm not taking credit for the advent of electronic music. I mean, of course, of course electronic music was here way before I started making tracks, but nobody was calling it techno music until I started calling it techno music. You know, they are very modest and and and, so, and even in some cases quiet people. They've you know let this monster loose on <laughs> on the world, and you know there's no, no no stopping it at this point. That those guys really like pioneered it in the direction that it is now. They they started with you know four four beats. They they brought it to a, a 12 inch vinyl format, and we're like you know the DJing culture of techno. Not only are they these kind of um, figurative leaders of, of this sound, they're, they're still very relevant and very good musicians and DJs. And then when we finally had our chance to express our opinions upon the world, I guess it must have sounded like some alien shit, you know? And that's why we sit here today. Takes me away. Love takes me away. Away, away. Too deep to understand. Mysterious as the darkness. Your heart is hiding Take me away, love, take me away, away.
Don't take me away.